Now I'm going to talk to you about machine learning and its applications in finance. Firstly, you've probably all heard the buzzword, machine learning. But what does it mean for computational finance? What it means is that we can do things like credit scoring, algorithmic trading, things which are very data and processing intensive. It means that we could, for example, interpret the written word in financial reports using natural language processing. So it's all about big data and how to achieve optimal financial outcomes. Now we can train those outcomes to be more reliable. And I'll go on to explain how we do that. So firstly, there are two things about machine learning that you need to understand. There is supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So supervised learning is where the computer is trained on a model with known inputs and output data so that it can actually make predictions about the future. Meanwhile, unsupervised learning is where hidden patterns are found and intrinsic structures in that data are found through statistical techniques. So let's talk about supervised learning. So this is where we're taking classificational techniques using discrete responses. So for example, whether a risk is acceptable or unacceptable, if you're, for example, in a bank. So classificational models take the input data, such as financial instruments, and they categorize them. So typical, allocate, typical applications include asset allocation, stock selection. Meanwhile, regression techniques can predict continuous responses. So for example, take volatility. Market volatility is changing. And in that respect, you can use the regression technique to work out whether or not you are above normal or below normal, above the regression line, below the regression line. So typical applications include risk oversight and, for example, algorithmic trading. Unsupervised learning finds hidden patterns or intrinsic structures in the data. So it can be used to draw inferences from the databases that you put into it. Now, clustering is the most common technique on this. And in that respect, it's used to do exploratory data analysis to find hidden patterns or groupings in data. So for example, take an index. An index is made up of stocks that vary and co-vary. Now they co-vary and uh, vary with each other or with other sorts of subgroupings. And those subgroupings, which sometimes we typically call sectors, can be found by clustering techniques. So when is it applicable to use such an, an approach? Well, for example, where financial rules and formulas are complex. Now in finance, there are lots of those. Take, for example, the Black Litterman version of mean variance modeling for portfolio construction. That already is using a Bayesian technique, taking the prior and uh, future forecasts and working out a distribution for them. Uh, however, when you're faced with regime change, in other words, when markets change, for example, from bull to bear, obviously the complexity increases. And in that case, you can use machine learning to improve the outcome. So you also use it when the rules of a task are constantly changing, as in fraud detection. And the criminals are always working out new ways to effectively do fraudulent transactions with a financial institution. And another place where it's applicable is where the nature of data keeps changing and the program needs to adapt to that. So, for example, arbitrage trading, where prices are effectively of two similar instruments are changing literally day by day, second by second, and the arbitrage program has to take that into account. So what about supervised learning and training the model? So let's take an example here. This one's based upon a spending monitoring app. So we're talking about fintech here. We're talking about a device that looks at your spending and tries to give you insightful comments about that. So what inputs do you get? Well, you get the inputs from, for example, your mobile phone, from the bank, payments that you make upon that in a handheld way, or from your payment cards. The response or output of the purchases 
are made based on shop expenditure or web applications or even by access to your own bank account through an open banking interface. And that can draw in the data from the bank account. It will then use that input data to train a classification or model to identify your spending. And since the global is just classification, it is supervised learning. In other words, you're training the model, the classifier, to integrate with the app to use your data on spending to classify what that spending action. So how do you do that? Quite simply, you just basically take data logs. You create data logs of your spending of day one, day two, day right the way to 30, 31. Uh, you take monthly uh, spending because obviously you have uh, a seasonality in your spending. Your monthly spending patterns are quite similar. You build up a data file over, for example, a year, and then you split that data file into two sets say six months and six months, and then you use one as a training set to build models, uh, and that's referred to as a holdout, and you can use the other data set for cross-validation. Obviously, to do this, you need to derive features. This is known as feature extraction, and that's one of the most important parts of machine learning, because you're taking this raw data, in this instance, on spending, and effectively uh, getting the machine to learn from that. Uh, so from the spending tracker we've talked about, you extract features in terms of the frequency. So how many times do you spend money on, for example, chocolates? How many times do you spend money on transportation and so forth? And then you can, for example, distinguish between discretionary spending, nice to have, or for example, non-discretionary spending, need to have. In other words, you have classified it. And then you simply create a new classificational table. So when you build the model with that, you then start obviously applying some more uh, academ academic approaches. So you're creating a basic decision tree, for example, going this way or that way, uh, and you build that so that it becomes like a branch. So you start with what we call the K nearest neighbors, and in the simple algorithm, you store all the training data and compare the new points to the training data. And this returns the most frequent class of K nearest points in effectively statistical theory. Now, this actually gives better accuracy than the simple decision model tree, which is where machine learning comes into its own. So what you want to do is you want to look for opportunities to reduce the number of features. And in that respect, you do good old fashioned data mining, whether you're creating a correlation matrix, whether you're using principal component analysis, or whether you're using sequential frequent reduction. So it is data driven. Uh, and uh, in this respect, the other machine learning approach, unsupervised learning, is purely a data driven approach. And data can be analyzed and visualized and statistics applied to it. The statistics, you all know regression, you all, uh, we've discussed classification, uh, but obviously there's clustering from things like principal component analysis, there's associated rule learning, there's dimension reduction, and there's generative models that can be created. All of this can be used in one way or another to unsupervised learn that data to produce better outcomes. Now, in all this, we should just point out that there are trade-offs, and those trade-offs, obviously, you're using processing time to do this, and this is large amounts of data. So you have to have the trade-off on the speed of training, how fast you want the model to learn. Obviously, if you're doing something like algorithmic trading, you want it to learn pretty fast. Memory usage, obviously, if you're putting in more and more variables, you're going to use more and more memory as you learn and as you do the iterations of the machine learning. Also, how much accuracy do you want? How many times do you want to run this to get better accuracy? That's important and it's a trade-off. Uh, obviously, each time you run something on, say, um, AWS or whatever, a, a, a cloud-based supercomputer, it costs time and money. So what you need is transparency and interoperability. In other words, how easy do these algorithms work in order to make the predictions that you want? 
Let's take another example, this example of unsupervised learning and another financial application, cybersecurity. Protect your financial assets from effectively people uh, breaking into your system. So in that respect, we take a three dimensional approach to unsupervised learning. The first dimensional is goal or task led. So according to the Gartner's PPDR model, effectively any security tasks, a security in relation to security, your, your system can be divided into five categories, prediction, prevention, detection, response, and monitoring. Now, all of these are suited to unsupervised learning. The second dimension is the technical layer, and that is the what question. So, for example, what level do you monitor the issues? So obviously your computer system has different layers and different layers of vulnerability, and you have to work out at which point in the network you are detecting intrusion, at which point of the endpoint is malware being applied, what effectively application is being addressed in terms of database firewalls and so forth, the user dimension, UBA, or the process, the anti-fraud dimension. So in the third dimension of unsupervised learning, that is effectively the how question. How uh, can you check the security of a particular area? You've got all this data, you now need to do uh, work out what you're going to do with it. So again, you need to get the machine to learn to do that for you, because otherwise you're just receiving quite detailed reports. So you want to do that in either an in-transit or real-time approach, an at-rest approach, or historically. Uh, so all of this effectively then leads to the outcome that the machine learning approach is improving your uh, security outcomes in this particular example. So in conclusion, we have effectively machine learning, which is getting the computer to do stuff for you. It's getting to do financial problems without being programmed necessarily to do them. And in this respect, it's applicable to a whole range of finance applications. Portfolio management, you've all heard of robo-advisors. Algorithmic trading, we've mentioned. High frequency trading, where you're going in and out of a stock in seconds, milliseconds. Fraud detection, which I've just mentioned in terms of cybersecurity, for example, but also you can data mine um, effectively uh, what's going on in terms of um, people's accounts relative to their normal spending, for example, coming back to the classification we did on spending, loan insurance underwriting, risk management, many, many risk applications here, chatbots analyzing how they interact with the consumer, uh, document analysis, trade settlements, money laundering prevention whole raft of applications for uh, finance, which uh, hopefully now you, you hope to get a better insight into.